Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast, where we challenge the stigma associated with mental illness through conversations about a variety of issues impacting mental health. Here we bring you news, views, and interviews that intrigue, educate, and celebrate recovery. Leading us on this journey are the hosts of the Mind Vine Podcast, Daryl Mathers and Chris Bovey. Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast. My name is Daryl Mathers. I'm flying solo on this edition. Uh, of the show because we are doing something a little different uh, than we normally do. So Ontario Shores Center for Mental Health Sciences, which produces this podcast, uh, as well as providing a range of mental health services uh, to people living with mental illness from different parts of the province, uh, is embarking on an awareness fundraising campaign with our foundation, the Ontario Shores Foundation. We've done this every year uh, for the last five years. This one's a little different. Uh, so back in uh, this summer, we put out a call to individuals who might want to help us not only raise money for Ontario Shores programs and services, but also um, who want to advocate, uh, want to get involved, want to share their story. And we were kind of overwhelmed with the response. We have several uh, individuals who are not even necessarily connected with the hospital in terms of having received care here, but. Uh, want to move the conversation forward, want to get involved, want to change uh, people's perception. And so what we've ended up with is a campaign that really focuses on what's next in this pandemic. And we'll get into it with uh, our guest, uh, Kirsty Burroughs, in, in, in a few moments. But just to give our listeners and viewers an idea, uh, we're in the midst of this global pandemic. That's why I'm on Zoom at the moment and why we're all wearing masks everywhere we go. And uh, and we're doing everything we can to protect uh, each other and get through this. But we're also on the verge of a, a mental health pandemic. There's been experts across the globe that have said they we're going to feel the impacts of this uh, for quite some time. And we already know that mental health was, uh, was already uh, a hot button issue, if you will, or a growing concern across the, across the globe before the pandemic. And it's going to be even more so. So the campaign really takes a look at, uh, we'll mention it a few times during the course of this, uh, this episode, but protectingminds.ca, you can learn about uh, the campaign and what you can do to protect uh, our collective minds as we go through this uh, mental health pandemic uh, in the midst of the global pandemic. So uh, with that, I am uh, really pleased to welcome uh, one of our participants, uh, Kirsty Burroughs. Uh, welcome, Kirsty. Thanks for having me. Yeah, really, really, uh, Appreciate you taking the time. We even had some technical difficulties and you were very patient. <laughs> so thank you. And you are, uh, just to give people a sense of the, the reach of not only this campaign, but Ontario Shores, uh, you're located in Peterborough, right? That's your hometown? I am. It is my hometown. Nice. Yeah. And um, we'll talk a bit about your story, but um, what, first of all, what's your connection to, to mental health? What, What's Kirsty Burroughs in, in mental health doing as part of a, a campaign with Ontario Shores? Campaign with Ontario Shores. So my connection with mental health, I don't know, do you want me to go in depth about my like experience with mental health or? Sure, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, I feel like I've struggled for a long time. Um, I, it really hit me when I, I hit puberty, to be honest. I kind of knew things weren't right. Um, and I just kind of struggled through my teen years and then <laughs> like most people do, but I think I did a little bit more so. Um, and then I hit my early twenties and that's when I knew things weren't going how they should be going. Um, I had, uh, various, um, issues with anxiety. So my doctor, um, prescri prescribed me some medication and said, here, take one. If you feel a panic attack coming on. And um, I kind of just went with that. And then they put me on some more medications for depression. So I was showing signs of depression. Um, and then my dad uh, got sick and he actually passed away um, from cancer. So that was a triggering moment for me. And I just kind of struggled with that for a long time. And then I ended up just getting to the point where I needed to seek out more medical help. Um, I was just struggling day to day and I was actually diagnosed with bipolar, uh, two disorder. So I don't know if a lot of people realize that there's a difference 
um, in between bipolar disorders. Um, I didn't really know a lot about it until I was diagnosed. Um, so yeah, and I have been dealing with that diagnosis since then. So that was about two years ago. And, and like in, in talking to you before and, and reading your story, you were able to receive treatment. Uh, and what was that? What was that process like? So receiving treatment, especially for a complicated you know, disorder like bipolar two, it can be it can be very difficult. Sometimes you're able to to get there quicker. But how did how did it go for you? Yeah, so I was lucky enough because I work in healthcare, kind of understanding how the system worked a little bit more so than someone else maybe. Um, so I actually took myself to emerge right away at, um, the Peterborough hospital and I received treatment right there. And then, um, the staff were amazing. The doctor thanked me for coming in. He said that, um, I was doing the right thing. And then I think it was the, so that was, I think a Thursday and then they prescribed me medications, but said that they were referring me to the outpatient clinic at PRHC. Um, and so I think I saw a psychiatrist on the Monday and that is like a fa fast route, like to see a psychiatrist, especially in Ontario. I remember I was, um, referred to a psychiatrist, I think in my early twenties by my family doctor and it was a six month wait. So just, I think knowing healthcare, I, I kind of had the upper hand of just knowing, like, I need to seek help, help now and I, I need to get help. So, um, and then I've been being seen by a psychiatrist a, a patient program and it's been great. And um, part, being part of the program, I've had access to all these services for therapy, like CB, uh, sorry, CBT and then DBT, um, which have been like life-saving. They really have, so. You mentioned, you know, that, you work at being healthy, you know, like, that. <laughs> you know, the, but, yeah. so people, but I mean, we all, we all do in our own way, but when you have a, when you have a serious mental health issue, like you do, uh, mm -hmm. what does, what does working hard to be healthy? What, is that, what, is, what does that, what does that look like for you? Um, to be honest, I think it's all the things that everyone tells you that you need to do, but you actually have to do it. So I have to keep an eye on my sleep patterns. So um, I have an issue with that because I work shift work, but um, Jeff definitely triggering if I'm not having consistent sleep and then eating healthy is a huge, huge thing. If I'm not eating healthy and I'm just eating whatever I want, which is consistent of a lot of things you probably shouldn't be eating, I start feeling down. Um, and then exercising. So the pandemic's really thrown a wrench in that. Um, I was going to um, boot camp with a couple of my friends from high school weekly. Um, but since the pandemic, that kind of stopped. And that has been, that's been probably the, the toughest thing for me. I like, I want to exercise, but like, I'm not one that enjoys exercise and everyone that knows me will say that. So to try and get exercise back into my daily life right now, it's like, I, I'm not doing it. And it's something that I think a lot of people are probably struggling with right now, um, especially from home. But yeah, it's just those types of things and just working at it and just kind of having like a, I hate when people say it, but having a positive mindset, which is when you're severely mentally ill and I've been there, it's not possible. But I think, and then taking your medications regularly and finding the medications that work for you, um, which is a really hard route. I struggled for about a year and a half just trying to get the right meds and having that balance. And um, it, it was rough. It was really rough. And I think people don't realize how difficult it is to take medications for your brain and think that you're going to be able to, to function normally and not have... I, I was having anger outbursts and just it, some medications were um, triggering like hypomania. And I was just, yeah, I was, it was a difficult year, but like once you do get the right, right dosage and you kind of, you kind of see the light. <laughs> you, you touched on it uh, you know, a little bit. I know we'll get into your career and your work, your work during the pandemic, mm -hmm. but, but when we were essentially in lockdown or at least uh, even if, you know, those, even in the people that were going to work every day, they were in some type of lockdown. Uh, so certainly socially, you mentioned not being able to go to the gym with your friends like you had been. 
you know, I, we wonder as society, like it was really mentally stressful as a whole to be in, in, a, in that kind of isolation, to be shut down. When you have a mental health issue already, um, you know, what, what was that experience like you know, as, as the world's shutting down and, and the things that you need or the, some of the things that you need to be healthy are no longer available to you? Yeah, so when the, the pandemic actually started, um, I was going, I mean, I was in school full time and school closed. So I was doing online classes and then um, for work, they needed me to start working full time hours because we didn't know where the pandemic was going. So here I was essentially just at home and going to work. And especially with the population that I work with, I didn't want to be exposed to anything. So, and I think um, my partner and I, he also um, was working full time. So we, we didn't really get the whole Netflix binge type of pandemic that other people did. But at the same time, I think it was almost, it was scarier for us because we knew that we were going out and working and that we could be potentially exposed. But then part of me, I don't think I would have survived the pandemic if I was just sitting at home by myself. Like, I, I don't, I don't think that situation could have gone better for me. Like, I think me being out and working was ideally what needed to happen. Um, and I think that people that may not have been aware of their mental health, I think the pandemic may have brought that kind of to the forefront and being like, okay, maybe I do need to do things to keep my mental well-being. Whereas people with mental illness, it, it triggered all these things. And it's, and it was definitely difficult to just be like, okay, these are my coping mechanisms. They call it a toolbox. So this is my toolbox. This is what I have to work with. And this is how I get through things. And I was trying to get picking out all my tools and using all my mechanisms and everything. And I had a hard time. I really did. Um, and as did everybody and I'm still kind of struggling, but I think it is great that we're doing things like this just to kind of bring to the forefront that like people do need to um, be focusing on people that do have mental illness and that are struggling in this pandemic. So during the pandemic, you're, you're currently a registered practical nurse. You're, you mentioned mm -hmm. your goal to become an RN. Yeah. Uh, and during the, the height of the pandemic, you're in, you're at, really are in the front lines. You worked at a long-term, you worked at a long-term <laughs> care center. And yeah. We all know in Ontario was the hardest hit of all the populations. So what was that, what was the experience like going to work every day in that environment? Um, I'm guessing with a great deal of fear, stress, like, you name the emotion you would have been experiencing it there was a lot of fear absolutely um uh we were very lucky in the sense that we never actually had any COVID cases at our home um which was fantastic i think that was mostly by the staff's doing of just being very diligent of staying at home when they weren't at work um there was a lot of fear and um it was it was scary. It was. At, at one point, it, it got to the point where you would hear staff just talk about masks. And at the very beginning, we weren't all wearing masks. That wasn't part of um, mandated. Um, like we didn't, we weren't wearing masks. And then it became, I think probably about two, three weeks into the pandemic, that's when we had to wear masks at all times. And we've stayed there since. But at the very beginning, just the unknown of what and how COVID trans like is transmitted is was a huge fear and like our access to n95 masks was limited like i couldn't just go grab one off the shelf like it, it like it, it they're they're locked up we're not, we don't have access to them and i'm i can probably say that every long-term care home would be like that because they they were they were so worried about supplies um, and then we were getting these weekly phone calls from the union just to update us on like what was happening and even the like the seriousness of those phone calls kind of just hit you and it was like okay this is for real <laughs> like this is what's going on um that's that's kind of gone like gone away now i think the, the biggest fear was that if it comes into the home then it's going to affect the residents that we like hold dear to us like some of those residents have been there for 
over a decade and you, you truly do have a relationship with them and you would never want to do anything to harm them. So even now it's like just being mindful of what you're doing and being mindful of when you're going into the home. So. Well, you know, what was your day like, you know, in, in those early days, like you hear stories about uh, people having to uh, you know, get home and completely change their clothes, go right into the shower or, you know, whatever the case may be, whatever protocols that were suggested to them, depending on the environment that they worked in. And, and, and I guess in a lot of case, the, you know, the kind of the concern you have for the people you live with as well. But what was it like for you just like going into work every day, coming back and you know, manage? <laughs> Yeah, it was hard to like say, it was like, okay, am I safer at home or am I safer at work? Like which, which place is safer? And then I also, I had a partner that was also working. So he was out in the community. So it was, it was like a hard balance of trying to like keep everything sanitized. And so, yeah, I would get up, go to work. Work was actually at one point it was, almost less busy because things were shutting down. So realistically, like the residents didn't have anywhere to go. Management didn't have any extra things to be doing. So work actually, it almost got easier, which it sounds ridiculous, but um, they weren't, it wasn't as busy. And then when I'd come home, it was like, okay, well, I had a bin out in the garage <laughs> and I would take everything off and go straight to the shower. Um, but yeah, it was, it was stressful. And then just trying to get to the new like protocols, like staff were no longer allowed to go through the staff entrance. Like we were all coming through the front door and having our temperatures checked every shift. We had to declare any symptoms and the symptoms list is absolutely ridiculous. And, and it's like, okay, which ones are these are actually concerning and, um, and just kind of going from there. And then, and even staff, like, communication like we used to have a staff room where we'd see each other um from different units and then that support was gone because we were doing our um, meals in areas on the home areas that we were working on so it was almost like you felt kind of disconnected from like your support system at work as well like normally the nurses would all take their breaks together and there's one nurse per unit so then when I'm taking my break, I'm sitting in a room by myself instead of sitting in a room with three other individuals where you can just talk through your day. So, yeah. So when, you know, I think it was a couple months into your pandemic working experience that we started you know, putting the call out for participants with lived experience who uh, may have worked during the pandemic to come forward to share their story. What made you send that email? I read it, like the call out, and I was like, I don't think I've read anything that may sounds more like me, like de that defines me more. It was just like, okay, here I am, a nurse suffering from bipolar 2 disorder during a pandemic, and I have been quite open about my diagnosis. Um, I have a great support system, so I was like, what the heck, like, why not let the world know that this is this is what's going on with me and this is how the pandemic's affected me. So. So as you get, you, you haven't seen any of the images uh, out necessarily uh, in the community or online yet because uh, we're still a couple, um, at least a week away from the campaign officially launching. Uh, the people that I'm sure you've shared it with people, what's been the reaction that you're going to be a part of this and are you concerned at all when you start seeing your, your face and name you know, <laughs> online on, on Facebook or Twitter or wherever, like, does any of that? Yeah. You? Um, so I've only shared it with a few people that I'm part of the campaign right now. Um, and they have obviously been so supportive. They think it's great. Um, I'm a little, this, this is part of the stigma. I'm, I'm a little worried professionally. Um, I'm pretty open when it comes to my diagnosis with my coworkers. Um, but it's, it's more so residents and residents' families that I'm like, okay, this is, this is going to be my face and my diagnosis just out for the entire world to see. Um, that's tough. And I think I, I'm going to be okay with it. And I, I think it, I hope it helps other people to know that I'm a working professional and I'm also suffering from a 
pretty serious mental illness. So, so yeah. un understanding the, you know, that concern and, and, you know, trepidation around disclosing in, in your work environment, uh, what do you hope changes? Like, what do you hope comes out of this personally? Um, so I was pretty open about my diagnosis and it's just, it's started conversations like people on my social media that I may necess not necessarily have conversations with or haven't had conversations with in a long time kind of reached out to me and were like, Hey, like, it's great that you're so open about this. Like, this is what I'm struggling with. And just having that conversation and being like, it's okay to not be okay. Like it, it's okay that you have days that you struggle and it's okay that you need to reach out and get some help. And I think it's also, it's kind of a conversation to have when you are doing those medication changes and that if you are struggling and you're having those difficulties to be like, Hey, I'm having difficulties with my meds right now. I may not be myself, but this is why. And just kind of being able to have that open conversation and not kind of hold it in the, the just in the back of your mind and being like, I can't say that I'm having struggles. Are you going to have to get comfortable with seeing your face in places? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I'm not even a person that will post like selfies on social media or anything like that. So just to see my face plastered places is just going to be, <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> it's going to be weird, but exciting. Well, we're excited that you're you know, participating in this. Uh, anybody wants to learn more, it's protectingminds.ca. Uh, you're on the screen multiple times when podcasts you know, we're doing now goes online. And uh, you'll see it everywhere. Uh, so, thank you very much, Kirsty. Really appreciate your time and today, and as well as your participation. In the it's, it's really important, meaningful, and really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah.